actually, this is probably one of the most uh, important parts of this conference, which is, as I said, while some of you were still out on break, um, uh, educating the heart, educating children, uh, that's what turns them into uh, adults who have a heart. And uh, if it starts early, that's when uh, the best place to put that uh, building block uh, that will lead to a, a human being who cares. So I'm excited about this. My friend Chuck Grazon is going to moderate this. And uh, we're going to focus on uh, how do we instill compassion uh, within the educational system. So again, thank you all. All right. Well, my pleasure to come. Really an honor to be moderating this. And, and it was, there was a planted question from the audience right at the end of the last session about what is the optimal age for, thank you for that question, for cultivating compassion. And of course, this leads us right into what we're going to talk about now, which is how do we think about educating the heart in classroom settings? And we've got a great, great uh, uh, panel with us today. So we've got Brooke Dotson Laval, who is my friend and colleague, and just got married. Uh, was my colleague for many years at Emory, and had did, did one, and has been doing wonderful work with the Mind Life Institute. Uh, Dara Garamani, who uh, you were at my old. Uh, Place of employment, the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute, uh, who's an expert on self regulation and uh, social functioning. Uh, Lisa Fluck, who I, I know from my multiple trips to Madison, who is much involved in, and I'm sure she'll talk about, the amazing work they're doing in Madison on mindfulness in education. And, and then Patricia Jennings, who is uh, many things, uh, so many things I can't uh, even list them all, but at UVA much involved in social uh, intelligence, emotional learning, teachers, keeping teachers from cracking up, et cetera, really an expert <laughs> on how we can enhance uh, the life of our classrooms. So with that, uh, Brooke, do you want to start? Sure. Can you hear me OK? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chuck. Nice to see my fellow colleagues and panelists. What? Nice to see you. Thank you. I'm a little distracted. I just got married on Friday. <laughs> so today I'd like to share with you a conceptual framework that emerged out of the past year and a half of work I was involved in with the Mind and Life Institute. I was working there as the senior program officer for our Ethics, Education, and Human Development Initiative. And this work, in a sense, is an offering or result of some of that, and also a result of some of the work I did with the CBCT team down at Emory, too. So they deserve a little shout out here. The, the work we did was really an attempt to provide an organizing framework for this growing field of people interested in bringing compassion and care in our schools. And it builds off many, many years of leaders in the field of social and emotional learning, one of whom is on the stage with us, others involved also in contemplative education, and so on. And it's meant to be really an organizing conceptual framework. When this team got together, and I'll say more about the team in a little bit, we began with this image of the ethical child. When we think about putting forward compassion and care in our schools, we wanted an image to sort of ground us, or to lead us, or to give, give us a map of where we're headed. And we began with this image of a child who feels basically safe, okay, and welcome in this world. A child that feels that they belong. And from this basis of safeness and care, this child is open to, can be moved by, touched by, and sensitive to the world around him or her. And this kind of sensitivity, with this kind of sensitivity, this child also can respond to others in need with discernment, compassion, and care. We believe that children have a natural capacity for this kind of ethical sensitivity, a basic capacity to be compassionate, caring, loving, and so on. But this kind of capacity for care and compassion necessitates or depends upon them feeling safe, feeling seen, feeling like they belong. If they feel threatened, unsafe, we retract from the world. We pull back from the world. We no longer feel open to. We feel closed off from, closed off from others, closed off to others, self-focused, scanning for threats. The kind of capacity to build care really depends upon children feeling seen, as I said. And it's a feeling seen in a way, feeling loved in their potential. A kind of teacher that provides this care is one who sees the potential in his or her children, sees what they're capable of, and loves them in a sense unconditionally. 
Not that they don't want them to learn, grow, or succeed, but that their love and their care doesn't depend on how they perform. So their love is displayed just out of that, just out of that purity of heart, if you will, and not so that the child does something. And we can sense this difference. We can sense when someone is being really kind to us because they want something from us, or they want us to act towards them or behave in a certain way. And we can also feel it, it from another person when, when we feel basically welcome and accepted for who, for who we are. So this is the kind of context in which we, f we feel that it's necessary to bring children up for the, in this ethically sensitive way. The capacity, though, I'm also really pointing toward a context of care here, but we also recognize that to foster this kind of ethical sensitivity that I'm pointing towards requires skills training, requires that we help children learn or give them the skills to sense into their emotional life to become familiar with their own emotional life, and through that learn to sense into the life of others, to enhance their capacity for affection, care, and compassion, to build the building blocks of care and compassion, too. I'm really, I'm working on this here. <laughs> the kind of care that I'm also talking about is inherently relational. To borrow from Nell Nodding's, to be one caring, one needs to be one cared for. And so although I've just emphasized the role of the student in this caring model, much of our emphasis in this actual model is on teachers, helping them learn to become the objects and not just the subjects of care. This is incredibly difficult for many teachers, and many of you who work with educators or work with others in social service recognize the challenge for those who are so used to giving to be in the position of receiving care. And yet at the same time, this is fundamental to a deep, deep kind of caring. To be seen, to feel welcomed, is what empowers us to see and to be with others. So this is really fundamental to this model. The care I'm talking about here is actually not really new. Many scholars, practitioners, scientists from many different disciplines, many contemplative traditions have long recognized the importance of care. I think of Nell Nottings, who I just mentioned, and Carol Gilligan, who often emphasize the importance of care in moral development and educational context, and who also offered an implicit or maybe explicit criticism of the instrumentality posed in educational context as antithetical, actually, to a caring and nurturing environment. Many of you know Carl Rogers and his emphasis on being seen as really key to therapeutic benefit. Paul Gilbert, who's here, often emphasizes the three directions of compassion. Those in the developmental psychology recognize the importance of effective caregiving to the child's healthy development and so on. And there are also many contemplative traditions that recognize this implicit pattern that being seen, cared for, and so on is what empowers us to learn to extend care. So in other words, it's not that we're just trying to help children foster or, or, or develop a set of qualities to be kind or act kindly towards others, but helping them see that they're part of a, a relational caring community. This framework that we're putting forward in a sense is somewhat new, even though it builds on so much of the work in many different fields insofar as it, with few exceptions, many of whom are on the panel here, it kind of goes against or is not really recognized by many educational movements thus far. Many of them have focused primarily on enhancing student achievement, for example. So therefore, many of the interventions that are introduced in schools are done insofar as students enhance their academic performance, have less behavioral outbursts, and so on. Some of these programs are also focused on behavior management, using programs like this to get kids to sit still and pay attention. I don't know if you've ever seen some very simple mindfulness programs in schools. When you walk into a classroom and a teacher rings a bell and every child is quiet, You've seen that? It's really creepy. <laughs> so this is, this is not that. This is about helping children learn to feel free, at ease, at home, in their world, and so on. The emphasis here is also, as I'm mentioning, on the relationship. So many of these interventions that we've seen, and this is kind of a holdover from sort of modern American contemplative focus, have been primarily on the individual at the expense of the individual in relation to others. So we need, there's a need, I think, in this field for more interpersonal work in these programs. 
So I'll say really briefly about these three modes of care. The program itself, this is the mind and life model, is organized around three modes of receiving care, self-care, and extending care. And receiving care is what I've really been emphasizing mostly here, is about a set of practices and skills to help children and teachers learn to feel seen, learn practices for receiving, opening to the care of others, overcoming fears and obstacles to receiving care, being the, the object of that care. Self-care practices mimic many mindfulness practices that I'm sure many of you are familiar with but in the context of receiving care are allowed to deepen, allowed to let us in a sense settle in, feel more safe, welcome, be more intimate and open to our emotional life and experience. And from that, the mode of extending care flows a bit more naturally. It's as if we're empowered through these previous modes to open to and extend this natural capacity of care. And this mode, as I said before, is also in turn supported by specific skills training. So it's not just that in a healthy context in which we've been loved, that we'll naturally be loving, but that there is specific training we can offer teachers, students, and others to build their capacities for empathy, affection, compassion, and so on. And also discernment. So also how we act skillfully and responsibly in our world. Each mode includes psychoeducational material, the why it's important to receive care, the basics of attachment, really helpful for teachers and also in, at times for students of different ages, why we need to learn to be, be the object of care, how we can work through fears and obstacles, many social, socially conditioned, some gender conditioned, of why it's difficult for us to be seen as those who are not always doing but also receiving care. Each mode has a set of contemplative practices, many based on the innate compassion training model developed by John McCransky at Boston College, and also many of the practices offered in the CBCT program, and also like the Stanford CCT program you'll recognize, which we find helpful when we are dealing with some of these blocks to compassion. It's really easy, as you all know, to develop compassion or extend compassion to those that are close to us, nice to us, kind to us. But how we begin to work with others who are not like us, who are not part of our in-group, and who, worst of all, have maybe harmed or wronged us. So we recognize that there are skill building and strategies that we can use to help enhance this capacity for compassion. The programs also include skills training for helping us deepen capacity for communication, working in groups, and so on, with a real emphasis on compassion, in a sense, in action, in the real world, in community, building community in schools, especially among teachers. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. The past year and a half, I've worked with an interdisciplinary team of contemplatives, educators, developmental psychologists. This is some of our core group who used to meet at our house in Amherst, Massachusetts, where Mind and Life is located. And we spent a year and a half surveying some of the best practices in the field, some of the best educational models, some of the best emerging contemplative models, like the models I mentioned, some of the best mindfulness and education programs, some of the best SEL programs, some other incredibly innovative work too that maybe didn't fall in this domain. Surveying and really trying to put together a map of the work that's already out there that's already in a sense pointing towards this but helping provide teachers with an organizing map in some sense so we could make explicit what's already implicit in many of their classrooms. If you walk into a classroom of a phenomenal educator, you'll see that they are embodying this work. They are seeing the potential in their students. They're holding space in that classroom in which children feel safe enough to learn, to explore, and so on. And so some part of this work was motivated by a sense of giving teachers a map to make their own work come to life in that way. And also to help organize the field that in some ways is disparate and often siloed. You often see programs, there are many, many programs that aren't really in great communication with one another or have evolved or grown up in different parts of the country with different, for different reasons and haven't really communicated effectively with one another. The world of SEL and con the contemplative education are one example of that, although there are many exceptions. So this is really meant to be, again, an organizing rubric for the field. So we came together and developed a rubric around these three modes and start to put a, pull out the best practices from some of the existing programs, starting to begin to map developmentally what this would look like for different ages, what a teacher program would need to look like to support a student program, how we empower teachers to help us co-develop a student program, seeing that they're the ones who have the information that we need, not us really, not outsiders. 
So over the past year and a half, after we developed this rubric, I worked with a team of teachers in the Amherst area, about 25 teachers over the course of a year, and we went through sort of the first pilot care program, called a care program, in Amherst. And through that, a small team of teachers from the Smith College campus school emerged as co-developers of a student program. And so that is in the works now. We have an upper and lower elementary school program that they co-developed with us. And although I was talking primarily this whole time about developing a framework, we also felt the need to develop one specific kind of program that we could run on the ground that could feed back into this framework we were developing, and vice versa, that this framework could also feed back into the curriculum we're co-developing. So over the summer, we held this conference in Amherst, Massachusetts, where we invited a number of different schools from New York, Connecticut, Madison, Seattle, to come and share in and experience this framework with us. So we could also learn from other programs on the ground, like Lisa's program, for example, and get feedback on what's missing from this program. How could this speak more broadly? Could this be a more broadly organizing field, program for the field? We also brought in teams in a global workshop from India, our Tibetan friends in exile, Bhutan, Vietnam, South Carolina, Israel, and so on, many of whom are engaged in this work in their own respective countries. And we had them come and share best practices for cultivating care and compassion in their, in their locations. And also, we did a presentation on this model and had them share in what worked, what didn't work, how we could adapt, and so on. And we're planning, in a sense, this sort of global virtual community of, of care and compassion in which we can share this framework more broadly, stimulate research in this area, stimulate research around measures for this and so on, collect best practices, having, in a sense, a living wiki of best practices for care and compassion for development, developmentally appropriate ages. In a sense, this, like I said, is really meant to be an offering, not one new program, not one other program, which teachers hate, but an organizing program for the field. I'll just end with this, I'm almost out of time, that over the past few months now, we've been doing a distance-based program with a team from Amherst, actually seven teams from Amherst, New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York, in which we've been offering a distance program for teachers who are now going to be offering a student program in the spring. And in addition to our online program, these teachers are matched in small groups. And it's becoming clear that this is, seems to be one of the most effective components of this program. Having teachers spend time together sharing their practices, spend, sharing time or spending time in community in which they feel that they, are belong, they belong and are seen and so on. And in a sense, by showing up to that community are actually also extending that care to their other colleagues in a sense. So we're just really wanting to end here the power that we're noticing of this community and also that to go along with this, this kind of work that I'm articulating really won't ever succeed so much if it exists as simple programs dropped into school systems. That there's much larger structural issues we need to pay attention to as we think about designing or developing care and compassion-based programs in our schools. Much larger systemic issues that we're up against that need to be engaged and not pushed aside if this work is really going to take hold. That'll end. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with taking us back to the grocery store. Uh, this time, instead of your keys being dropped in the parking lot, you're standing in line. Um, and uh, in this case, also, there's someone right in front of you uh, who is very furious, very stressed out, and yelling at the uh, checkout clerk. Meanwhile, you're having a really rough day, and uh, let's say that you had a fight with your partner, um, you got into a car accident, a fender bender, or, um, and also you happen to lose uh, half your slides for a talk you were giving the next day, <laughs> which is kind of what happened to me. Uh, so, um, you know, on the outside you may look composed, but on the inside you might feel <laughs> like this. Uh, in which case, um, when you're in this situation, you see this, you may want to uh, find the shortest line to quickly get your things and get out of there, or you just want to leave altogether just because you don't have the resources available to sustain being in that situation. Uh, now let's switch scenarios. Let's say uh, you're, uh, instead of 
all of those awful things happening that day. You had a very pleasant day at the beach. You're just coming back to get some groceries, uh, <clears throat> to have a lovely dinner with friends later that night. And uh, opposite to that, to previous uh, situation, you feel like this on the inside. So um, in this case, you may be more willing to actually go and uh, you know, sustain being that lion and uh, be kind to the checkout person. And mostly because you have the resources in order to do so. Um, so really the point here is that it's not so much uh, whether you have it in you as a person to be compassionate, it's just that the state you're in, and particularly maybe the stress state you're in, uh, isn't allowing you to express it. So given this example, um, we can think of some building blocks of compassion that may be compromised by stress. And the first might be empathy. So being stressed, you may not even um, be in a state to receive the signal that um, someone is in distress. And you may not even be able to um, simulate that emotion within yourself in order to act. Um, <clears throat> with self-control, um, you may not be able to inhibit that uh, impulse to get out of that situation because it's too much for you. Um, and also, related to self-control, you may not have the capacity to modulate your emotions to really be available for the people around you. And also, you may not have that sense of social responsibility that would even motivate you to take action, that sense of belongingness that you're connected to the individuals around you, the community around you, and to take action accordingly. So um, <clears throat> if these are things that are compromised, that can be compromised by stress, um, how, how could we actually alleviate the stress? So um, we've all been in these situations where we may be upset or stressed and someone might come up to us and just tell us not to be stressed. Um, and I, I think in general that doesn't really work. And we know from uh, work in psychology that you know, even if you try to suppress thoughts or emotions, it's really difficult to do so and often it has the opposite effect of actually increasing whatever you're feeling. So um, you know, if, if that kind of cognitive approach to uh, alleviating stress isn't so effective, um, what are some other um, approaches? And I'm really thankful for um, Dr. Uh, Porges' eloquently um, delivered talk earlier today, talking about the breath, because um, that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about today. And so, you know, alternate to uh, telling you to, to not stress, some people might advise you to take a deep breath, and that tends to have a more effective outcome. Um, so some researchers in Belgium wanted to put this relationship to the test. They wanted to see if you elicit um, an emotion in subjects, in research subjects, are you able to determine a distinct breathing pattern that's associated with that emotion? So they showed different emotional expressions and measured their respiration rate, so the depth of the breath, the, the frequency of the breath. What they found was <clears throat> a, a, a discrete relationship between uh, different breathing patterns and individual emotions. So what's interesting about the study is that they brought in a separate group of subjects. Um, and this time they wanted to see whether a given breathing pattern was related to particular emotions. So with this group, they only had them simulate the breathing patterns that they observed in the first group, and they had them rate what they were feeling at the time. And 60% of the time, they were likely to, re to uh, label their emotions as to what these emotional expressions actually represented. So it seems that there's a direct link between uh, emotions and the breath, and this really is a two-way street, which is interesting given that the breath is one of the few autonomic um, functions that we can actually control. So <clears throat> this has led... Uh, uh, to the question of whether you can use the breath to manipulate um, stress. And in this case, uh, Emma Seppala did a study with veterans who had PTSD. And the question here was whether you could use these breath-based meditations where you really go through several exercises to control the breath, and whether that would have an impact on something so severe as PTSD. So this was a group of veterans, and this was actually done in Wisconsin when she was a postdoc there, 
who went through this seven-day workshop. They learned um, this Sudarshan Kriya yoga breathing technique. They also went through some gent uh, gentle yoga postures, some group processes where they really engaged with each other on what they had experienced in their, uh, in their combat experiences, um, and also other kinds of discussion. And what they found was that over time, uh, you know, they took measures directly after the seven-day workshop, one month later, and then also one year later, and consistently they found a decrease in PTSD symptoms, in this case specifically hyperarousal, across over a one-year span. And what's remarkable here is that they went through this breathing training, this was seven days, and many of them did not continue this training. So even though they didn't continue over this one-year period, they still saw these effects. And these effects, the changes that they observed were also associated with physiological changes in the startle response. So uh, now my research is mostly on adolescents, and some people uh, ask me, you know, what kind of stress do adolescents experience? And um, I just wanted to uh, relay some examples that uh, an instructor recently informed me about in a school she's teaching in New York. Um, so peer stressors are, are very common among um, adolescents. Obviously, there are cases of bullying. There are uh, really detrimental sexting scandals, actually. Um, <clears throat> there's also academic pressures, but it really often goes even, uh, gets more serious than this. So um, students are often pressured to be recruited into gangs. In one case, this was someone whose cousin was shot right in front of his house. Um, there's also familial abuse and violence. Um, so there was a girl who was kicked out of her house for being pregnant and suffers from postpartum depression. There's another case where a student was constantly being threatened by uh, his parents that they were going to kill him. So these are also very extreme situations. Um, the question that we had was, can we build, enhance these building blocks of compassion, particularly self-control, empathy, and emotion regulation using these breathing techniques? What we um, <clears throat> studied was a program called Yes for Schools that incorporates this, these uh, breathing techniques into, this, uh, into their curriculum. It's a multifaceted program that includes uh, breathing and contemplative practices, self-awareness exercises, empowerment techniques, and human values processes. And this is a, about a 30-hour program designed to reduce stress and uh, teach skills for managing negative emotions. I'll just go into a little bit more detail of what these individual components are. So overall, these breathing techniques plus um, you know, other restorative practices are incorporated. These self-awareness exercises are interactive, so students are really engaged in um, these group games that um, through, this, through the participation, what emerges is this awareness of the present moment. Um, they also learn these empowerment techniques. These are essentially cognitive reappraisal strategies. For example, seeing problems as adventures or uh, taking responsibility instead of complaining. So very concrete approaches to managing situations. Also, they um, engage in what are called human values processes, and these are really designed to uh, bring awareness to students that they're really connected with each other and their community, and that there are fewer differences between them um, than there are uh, similarities. So uh, we conducted a study on a measure of uh, self-control using uh, a self-reported impulsivity scale. These were three high schools in the inner city Los Angeles uh, with students who are faced with many of the similar stressors I just listed. Um, they underwent this YES program in their PE course. This is about four weeks every day during their PE course. Um, and we just had them take, fill out a simple questionnaire, the Barat Impulsivity Scale, before and after the program. What we found was this reduction in impulsivity uh, comparing before and after the program and with no difference in the control group. And this was really interesting to us, given that self-control behavior is really such a strong predictor of many outcomes later in life. We also found uh, that the program increases emotional empathy. This is actually in a different cohort in Los Angeles. 
And the question came up uh, as to how these breathing techniques in particular may enhance emotion regulation. And what we wanted to do here is measure both their self-reported their, and their behavioral um, uh, emotion regulation as well as neural measures of emotion regulation. So this is an fMRI study that's actually still ongoing and I'll present some very preliminary data now. Um, the students who've gone through this program, they come in on two separate days. And one day, on one day they engage in these breathing practices that they learn in the program. And then immediately uh, go into the MRI scanner and they, they do this emotion regulation task. It's a reappraisal task. And on a separate day, and this is our um, controlled condition actually, they go through a very simple relaxation exercise. They're just asked to visualize different colors with their eyes closed. And again, they're given the same uh, measurement of emotion regulation in the scanner. So this is very preliminary data, but what we've seen is when you compare um, emotion regulation activation after going through the breathing exercise versus the relaxation, we see increased activation in the insula. So we know that especially the anterior insula is very important for what's called interoception. Um, this is awareness of, of bodily functions and generally of, of the body. Um, and so this is still very new data and we're still you know, considering our interpretations, but I think that um, it's interesting that the breathing, the breath-based meditation techniques may actually increase awareness about the body, about the state of the body, especially during the experiences of emotion. So in terms of concluding, I think we can say that stress can weaken these building blocks of compassion. In particular, I've talked about self-control, uh, empathy, and emotion regulation today. Um, stress can be a powerful modulate, can be powerfully modulated by these breathing techniques. And the youth, youth programs, uh, you know, much like what, what Brooke uh, discussed and, and others that integrate these breathing techniques could really have a powerful effect on these, uh, these building blocks. What I haven't shown you is a direct link between these building blocks and um, stress, in, at least in the cohorts that I've measured, and I'm hoping that will come through through uh, more data collection. I just want to thank uh, the collaborators on this, um, several people at UCLA, uh, Dr. Emma Seppala, and funding agencies. If you'd like to learn more about the youth program, it's, um, the website is there, and that's my email address with one minute remaining. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good afternoon. I'll be sharing about some of the work that we've been doing in Madison schools with teachers and students. And the work is motivated by the understanding that we've gotten from some of the research on adults, showing the effectiveness of mindfulness practices for promoting both physical as well as mental health. And while there are many programs for children, there's actually very little empirical research to guide the implementation of the programs. And that's one of um, the goals with the work that we're doing is to develop a research base to better understand what kind of effect the practices are having with students and teachers in the classroom. And um, finally, there's the idea that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And the economist James Heckman has estimated that doing early work, preventive work saves yields a return for every dollar invested of seven dollars in return. And so there's um, an economic incentive there, as well as understanding the importance of early life skills for later development and outcomes. There's a really interesting longitudinal study that followed about a thousand people from birth to age 32. The study was conducted in New Zealand. And they found that early levels of self-control when children were four and five years of age predicted outcomes into adolescence and adulthood, even above and beyond the effects of IQ and socioeconomic status. And so that children who displayed higher levels of self-control at a very early age as adolescents were less likely to be teenage parents, more likely to graduate from high school, 
and subsequently as adults had more financial stability, better health, and were less likely to have problems with the law. So this really highlights the importance of self-control at an early age. And the way that Brooke had described the nurturing teachers and nurturing students framework, we've taken a similar approach in this work and start by offering training with teachers. And we've used a modified MBSR training that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and the results of this study, uh, it's a pilot study, so a small sample, but they're published in a journal called Mind, Brain, and Education, if anyone is interested in looking it up. So I'll just briefly highlight uh, the overall study. But teachers were assigned, randomly assigned, to a training or control group. And the training group received eight weeks of a modified MBSR, and all of the teachers did testing before and after the training period. And they completed self-reports, computer tasks of attention. They offered saliva samples to look at biomarkers of stress. We conducted classroom observations by blind observers. And they recorded their practice times. The modified MBSR training consisted of your, the basic central mindfulness practices, so bringing mindfulness to the breath, body, feelings, and thoughts through both informal as well as formal practices, including walking and sitting, mindful movement, and loving kindness practices. And they were offered CDs so that they could practice outside of the class. So practices ranging from 15 to 45 minutes, and were encouraged to do this um, each day. And just to quickly recap, the teachers who went through the mindfulness training showed increases in self-reported mindfulness, in compassion, less burnout, and fewer psychological symptoms, including anxiety and depression. And on computer tasks of attention showed less bias, and as well as increased classroom organization. So actual instructional practices showed improvement um, in the teachers who went through the training. And this is consistent with other work in the field that's been emerging and that you'll hear more about in the next presentation as well. So I'm going to skip a couple of these slides to get to the work that we're doing with preschool students and a kindness curriculum that's a mindfulness-based pro-social skills curriculum that was developed for preschool-age children. And so the, in this case, the teachers in these classrooms were offered a mindfulness-based stress reduction, a, mind, a modified mindfulness-based stress reduction. And then after that, the students received training in the kindness curriculum. So we randomly assigned by classroom to either be a control or the intervention group. And the kindness curriculum training consists of about 12 weeks of sessions twice a week that last for 20 to 30 minutes each session. And we did, as with teachers, pre and post testing with both groups of children and also followed them up at six months once they were in their kindergarten year. And students completed computer tasks of attention, behavioral tasks to look at pro-social behaviors, teachers reported on classroom behaviors, and we also collected report card grades from their school records. And the results of this study are forthcoming in an issue of developmental psychology that will be out early next year. But I'll highlight, um, describe a little bit of the curriculum and highlight some of the early findings. And so the kindness curriculum is very interactive and hands-on. It consists of books, music, movement, and tangible objects that children use to learn concepts and have the experience of them. And the theme of the curriculum is the ABCs which stand for attention, bodily awareness, caring practices, a recognition of our interdependence, recognizing emotions and their impact on others, cultivating forgiveness, as well as gratitude and generosity. And each day, the children set an intention. May all things that I think, say, and do not hurt anyone and help everyone. And these specific ways that we can help and not hurt others are posted in their classrooms. So a theme that runs through all of this is planting seeds of peace in all that I do. And this clip is um, of Laura Pinger. She developed the kindness curriculum. She's modeling for them a belly buddy practice. Did it go up and down fast or slow? Slow. Very slow. Did I do this? No, I just felt like everybody gets a belly buddy 
You lay back, put your heads down. And please be not touching anybody beside you. When I see that your bodies are still, Miss Bremer and I will put a belly buddy on your belly and I'll start the music. Body still. Feel the back of your head on the carpet and your heels on the hard carpet. Ready? When you breathe in, your belly fills up with air. And when you breathe out, the air comes out and your belly goes in. Ready? <laughs> So this is um, just a portion of the practice, and the song is by Betsy Rose called Breathing In, Breathing Out. She has a great collection of songs on her CD. And um, the way that Laura transitions out of the activity is having children walk back, noticing the sensation of their feet on the floor to the circle, and then checks in with them to ask them how they're feeling, and asks them, did your body feel calm? Does it feel busy? And students... Um, they actually report both, but overwhelmingly calm. And this is a practice in particular that students request on their own that they um, like to have their teachers do even when the kindness curriculum teacher isn't in the classroom. So just to show you a couple of the other practices, this is an example of the belly buddy with the stone. And there's books that have um, tapped into the different themes. So Smile That Went Around the World is about interdependence. And then When Sophie Gets Really, Really Angry is on the theme of managing difficult emotions. There is over 20 books that they use within the curriculum. The mind jar is like a snow globe. So it represents the way that the mind can get, when it's shaken, it can get agitated, filled with thoughts or um, strong emotion, and that the Practices allow us to settle and to let those thoughts and emotions settle so that we don't have to get caught up in them. And at the end of the session, at the end of the curriculum, children make the ABC bracelets to remind them of the different practices that they've learned. To go into some of the research that we've done on this, teachers reported on children's social competence before and after the training period in both sets of classrooms, both the intervention and control groups. And on this scale, teachers are rating both children's pro-social behavior as well as their emotion regulation. And what we see is that both groups increase significantly in social competence, but the children who go into the kindness curriculum training so the kindness curriculum is in the dotted line, and the control group is the solid, solid line. The kindness curriculum group shows greater improvements in social competence compared to the control group from before to after the training period. And some of you may be familiar with the delay or gratification paradigm. We used a variation of it where children were offered choices, different contingencies, one versus two, one versus three, or one versus five, of three different types of items, crayons, snacks, or tokens that they could exchange for toys. And they did nine trials of this. And children who, oh, it's missing a slide, but I'll uh, just share with you. So the children who did, who went through the kindness curriculum group made more delay choices from before to after the training. And the control group did not change in their amount of delay. A task that we adapted and created specifically for the study to look at pro-social behavior is based on economic games. And so a currency among four-year-olds is stickers. And so they're offered 10 stickers, and there's four different trials. They're, uh, they're invited to keep as many stickers as they would like for themselves, and they put those in the red me envelope. 
and they can give as many stickers as they like in turn to one of um, each of these four recipients. The child that they identify, identify as liking to play with, a child who they identify as one that they don't like to play with, a stranger, or a child who's sick. And then we look at how much they share from before to after. And there's an interaction here where children uh, who are in the kindness curriculum group stay steady in the amount of stickers that they keep for themselves. The, um, it shows this axis, the vertical axis, is how many stickers they keep for themselves. And in the kindness curriculum group, they're keeping about half from before to after the training. In the control group, they actually keep more stickers for themselves. So they start out sharing about half, but then they become, you could say, more selfish over time, whereas you don't see that change in the kindness curriculum group. And then we looked at end of year school grades. These were grades given by teachers and are their report card grades, and saw differences between the two groups in the areas of approaches to learning, students in the kindness curriculum group that are on the blue bars, compared to the control group in the red bars, had higher grades in their approaches to learning, their physical health, and social emotional learning. And at follow-up, this is when children were in their kindergarten years. So this was after the kindness curriculum had ended. They'd gone through a whole summer and not received any other training. And so not surprisingly, this is, I, I wanted to show this to demonstrate really that any effects of training fall off and the two groups become equal by this third time point without any further supports or training. And so whereas you see the increase from pre to post in the blue line, it drops off and the two groups are rather similar by the third time point in kindergarten. And this is also true of delay of gratification. They just even out. And so it really does suggest that in order to sustain any of the benefits, we need to wait, find ways to support students and also teachers in sustaining the practice. So there's many questions and directions in the future, including sustainability, and also questions of how do you scale this up while still preserving the integrity? And just to briefly highlight, other projects happening at the center, one of the directions that we're looking at in terms of some of the future directions is, is it possible to train classroom teachers to directly deliver the mindfulness-based training to their students instead of having an outside instructor come in? And that could make it available to many more students and teachers. And uh, we're looking at programs with mindfulness with parents, um, wider school district initiatives around wellness for staff, and video game training at the middle school level. The center's website is at the bottom if anyone is interested in looking up more information. And this work um, is only made possible by the contributions of many people and organizations. And so just to acknowledge um, the collaborative effort. I'm going to talk about some of the work we've been doing uh, with teachers and students. Um, but first, I, I want to uh, emphasize the, the previous comments about working with the teacher. Uh, I really, when I started this work, I, first of all, I was a teacher for 22 years. And I feel like it's really important to include the teacher in the process of uh, the change that we're trying to make in the classroom. How many people here are teachers? Yay, great. How many people here were teachers at one point or another? K-12 K teachers. Okay, great. You too, huh? <laughs> okay. I know a lot of you are college teachers too. But uh, what I want to point, about, point out in this talk is that the context, the, the classroom context is really unique in, in certain ways. And um, as far as the background, oh, here's the changer. Uh, is this how this thing works? Okay. So a little background um, on why the classroom is challenging, why it's important to student outcomes. Um, and then talk about the Care for Teachers project, which is the project for teachers I've been working on for the last 10 years or so. And then a little bit about the Compassionate Schools project that we are just initiating at the University of Virginia. 
So back in 2008, my colleague Mark Greenberg and I published a paper in Review of Educational Research pointing out the importance of teacher social emotional competencies in these other dimensions of classroom quality. So we know for children to grow up well in a classroom and learn to be compassionate, learn to care for one another, they need to be in a healthy classroom climate. They need to have a classroom that's warm and safe and conducive to learning. Um, we also know there's a lot of evidence that the relationship that the teacher builds with their students is critical to this environment. We also know that classroom management skills play a role in this. And we also know that social emotional learning programming plays a role. The thing we didn't know very much about and we are just starting to learn about are what are these social and emotional competencies that the teacher needs in order to create this environment. Now, the other thing that's important to know is that the context, this work context, is particularly challenging. Um, it requires exceptionally high degrees of certain kinds of social and emotional competencies. When things are going really well, those of you who are teachers know that it can be one of the most rewarding jobs. It can be very fulfilling. However, when it's not, um, it can be really difficult. There can be uh, conflicting expectations, as demonstrated in this cartoon. Um, there can also be role confusion. Um, there can be conflicts between individual children's express needs and institutionally mandated needs. That's happening all the time. Um, greater numbers of children are coming to school with needs that are unmet, including exposure to trauma. And teachers are not necessarily trained in understanding the kinds of behaviors that come, that come along with exposure to trauma. Um, so, the other thing about this, the other part of this picture, in terms of this context, is it's highly cognitively demanding. <laughs> uh, a teacher needs to pay attention to multiple things at the same time. And this attention is drawn in different ways. For example, you have to be able to pay attention to one particular student that you're helping while you're noticing your whole class and maintaining attention to where you are in the content, the, the delivery of the content you're supposed to be teaching. It's pretty, it's pretty tough. Um, there also these demands are unpredictable and they can be highly volatile and emotionally provocative. Now the other thing on top of this is it's virtually the people in this room are virtually captives. You're not really a captive, but you can't walk out of your classroom when you're teaching. You know, you, you can't just leave, right? Um, te the kids can't leave either. So when you, put, when you put people in that kind of situation and you turn the dial up on emotional, emotions or emotional, um, uh, emotional content, it, it, it gets pretty difficult. Now on top of that, Teachers have to self-regulate in this context and be professional. Uh, so when a teacher becomes emotionally aroused, they have to somehow find a way of self-regulating while being in front of kids. This is really different for most adult work contexts because when we have problems in our work spaces, in offices, we can usually excuse ourselves, take a break, have a moment to compose ourselves. Well, teachers don't have that. They can't even go to the bathroom when they t need to. Um, which is, is really, really stressful. Uh, this, this relates to what Mandy was talking about, about second shift, because teachers are so, that their jobs are so demanding, they don't have time to take extra time to do something else. So when you start talking to them about, you know, taking an extra training, it's, it, it's a big deal. So back when Mark Greenberg and I wrote that paper, we looked at, um, we reviewed the literature on burnout in te among teachers. And what we found was there's this progressive process that happens where by a teacher becomes emotionally exhausted, which you could see from that previous cartoon why that might happen. Um, one way of coping with that exhaustion, it's not a healthy way to cope, but it does help relieve that exhaustion, is to depersonalize your students. And so that's one way of saying in your own mind, well, I don't have to deal with that person because nobody could, because that person is beyond help. It, it's a way of distancing yourself so that you don't have to be compassionate. Um, you hear words like, oh, he's just a little monster. That's an example of depersonalization, and that's exactly the opposite of compassion. And that's what happens when we become exhausted. Um, and then you become, you, you don't think you can teach anymore and you give up. And actually, 50% of teachers um, are leaving within five years, and um, you can see from these statistics, this is, since 1986, um, there hasn't been the, the, a, 
a, a low level of, of satisfaction among teachers since 1986, this low, and it's been dropping very quickly. And it's costing a lot. It cost, in Chicago, it was estimated at $86 million per year, teacher attrition. It's costing the city of Chicago. It's a lot of money. Um, so a little study that I did, I was interested in the relationship between depression and classroom quality. And these are um, observational, this is an observational measure of the classroom called the class. And that shows you how highly correlated in a negative way depression as measured by the BDI is uh, to these quality, these quality of, uh, this quality of the classroom. So mental health of teachers is really important. So what are these social-emotional competencies that teachers need to function in their classrooms? So we drew upon the research that's been going on in the social-emotional learning world, uh, the Collaborative for Academic Social-Emotional Learning. So how am I feeling? What um, are my triggers? What are my scripts around this situation? Being aware of what, what my emotional landscape is like, knowing that, understanding that, in the midst of this craziness that's going on. How do I regulate my emotions in the midst of teaching? How do I keep my mind focused on what's happening around me? Um, and how do I build strong relationships with my students? And what needs are they expressing? And what are their perspectives? This is something that I think is really critical to being a good teacher. You have to be able to understand that your students are not seeing the situation the same way you are at all. In fact, often when teachers are burned out, they take student behavior personally. And often it is not personal at all. In fact, it isn't, it isn't related to them at all. Social awareness, what are the social dynamics of this very complex situation? And how can I make a positive influence? And finally, what are the appropriate actions to take in response to the situation that will be beneficial to everyone? So we became interested in how do we, how do we cultivate these um, competencies um, and so we've been, for the last 10 years or so, we've been developing this program called Care for Teachers, or Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education. And you can find out more about this at careforteachers.org. So this is a pretty intense program model because we wanted to prove the pro-social classroom model. And we wanted to be able to show if we improve teacher social emotional competencies, would we also improve the classroom and would we also improve student outcomes? So we felt like we needed to give teachers a pretty big dose. So this is a five day training. It's spread out across the, the, uh, the fall and there's a booster in the spring. It includes phone coaching in between sessions. It focuses on time management and self-care. And we find this is really critical because otherwise teachers don't recognize that they need to take the time to take care of themselves in order to be the best that they can be. Um, it also includes a lot of information about emotions that I learned from Dr. Ekman. Um, they, we, we help them normalize the emotional experience so they can understand that it's, that it's only natural to be feeling the feelings that they're feeling while they're teaching in the classroom. We look at individual differences. We talk to them about how emotions affect teaching and learning and um, also experiential uh, exercises to promote emotional awareness in the context of the classroom. This is really important. Um, we do a variety of mindfulness practices uh, that have already been talked about, um, pretty much the same that everybody else is doing. We also do a series of activities that are intended to generate compassion, including one of the things I think we do that's really most important is we start by reflecting on the values and the moral purpose that they have as a teacher, by asking them, why did you become a teacher? What are the, um, the values you hold that drew you to become a teacher? Um, most teachers, most people who become teachers are very altruistic, and bringing them back to that helps generate this sense of purpose. Um, and so the intention setting process is linked to this moral purpose. And then reflection on feeling care, accepting care, like we heard earlier. How does it feel to feel cared for? How can you accept care from others and from yourself? And then we call it caring practice, but it's basically loving kindness practice, or metta. We also do uh, mindful listening exercises. Simple listening, then we get more and more complex where partners practice listening to one another just with an open heart, without 
um, answering or trying to explain or solve any problems, but just being present for the other person, experiencing the emotions that they're feeling and being self-aware of that while they're speaking or while they're listening. And then that moves into role plays where we take emotionally provocative experiences that they are currently having or have recently had, and we reenact them practicing some of the skills that we've been learning in the program. So I'm going to quickly go over our previous research. You can read the results from this research. It was published in, uh, well, there's been two papers, but the most recent one was School Psychology Quarterly in 2013. But we found improvements um, among the teachers, self-reports, in well-being, mindfulness, and efficacy. Right now, we have a very large, IES is Institute of Educational Sciences, it's the Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education. We have a large randomized controlled trial going on in New York City right now. Um, we have 36 elementary schools, 226 teachers um, that are randomly assigned within schools, and over 5,000 students in our sample. So we are in the process of doing um, HLM analyses, which is a hierarchical linear model. When you're looking at data that are clustered like this, you have classrooms within schools and children within classrooms. You have to use a hierarchical model. And the, the data I'm presenting here are the HLM models without any covariates. And we still need to add the covariates because they're going to boost the um, p-values on these. And I'll explain why in a minute. So we look, looking at the teacher outcomes, we're finding very similar effects. Um, we had to aggregate our variables because we had too many variables, and I don't have time to explain all this, but we're seeing similar effects that we did previously. However, we're not seeing effects on efficacy, but that's only because we have ceiling effects on this measure. These teachers felt much more efficacious than our previous teachers that we worked with. Um, we are seeing effects on the classroom, which is very exciting, and emotional support and classroom organization. Again, we need to add the covariates to this because typically you want to control for the size of the, the number of children in that classroom and the adult-student ratio, which we haven't done yet. Um, but this is ex exciting preliminary effects. Um, so we need to do these analyses, and then we also need to look at the student outcomes, but we anticipate that they'll be moderated by risk. So we have to identify which of those 5,000 students in that sample we feel will be most affected by this intervention, because we don't expect that all children would be necessarily affected by a teacher who's more warm and supportive. So finally, I just want to take my last minute to tell you a little bit about the Compassionate Schools Project. Um, we uh, at the University of Virginia, Patrick Tolan and I and my colleagues are developing an elementary health curriculum that is focused on compassion. It integrates social emotional learning, mindful awareness, nutrition, and yoga. Um, it's all based on, we're, we're drawing from science-based um, prevention programs. It's developmentally appropriate and it's aligned with the state standards. We're doing this in um, Louisville, Kentucky, which is a really exciting place to do it. Um, we are in partnership with the city of Louisville and the Jefferson County Public Schools. We'll be doing a randomized controlled trial with 50 schools randomly assigned to each condition. And they will, this will be delivered in health classes by credentialed teachers. Um, the classroom teachers, the regular classroom teachers, will be reinforcing the practices. And then we're also offering to the teachers this other um, training called CALM, which is a brief yoga-based program that we tested in State College Pennsylvania with my colleagues in Pennsylvania at uh, Penn State. Um, so I want to acknowledge all the people who made it possible for me to do this work, and um, there's a lot of them. And I also want to take my last second to let you know that I have a book coming out in February that um, really explains a lot of the evidence and the research behind the work we've been doing with teachers. It's called Mindfulness for Teachers. Thank you. All right. Losing my voice. Questions? Thank you so much for all, all, all your present. Um, my question would be to Tish uh, Jennings. Um, <coughs> two questions. First, uh, I come from Europe, and I, I just look, would like to know who is financing this, uh, this implementation. And uh, the second question is, uh, uh, have you, have you tested the response of uh, parents of, the, of those children? How do they receive that? 
in the, in the, at home. Okay, the first question was who funds the work we're doing? Who, who is financing? Which who, work, who, the teacher work or the child work? Uh, teacher work. Teacher work, okay. Yeah, t teacher. That, yeah. that work that I was showing you was um, funded by the United States government, Department of Education. Um, that we got a very large grant from the federal government for that. And I didn't understand your second question. You work with uh, kids, okay? Um, those kids get parents. What is the, resp the response of uh, the parents uh, at home? What has changed? Did you measure that at home? Because we haven't gotten that far yet. We're just in the process of planning, but you guys are doing that, right? We <laughs> the way that we've involved parents at this point is sending home letters describing the activities, and parents will report to us just anecdotally that their children are teaching them the practices. Um, but we do think that's a direction to really integrate parents into the training, too. Uh, yes, to any of the educators. I was wondering, did it, were any of you influenced by the Montessori model? I was a Montessori teacher. That would be a yes, I, I guess. This is a, an, an innocent and probably ignorant question, but it, um, it, it's a question about a gap that um, seems to have been um, illustrated by each of the speakers in their choice of the most evocative images of, of human tranquility and peace, being a child wading in, in, a, in a lake, um, a child handing a flower, um, a, a mother cat embracing a kitten, um, this connectedness to the natural world and and, um, and how that is a restorative and, and you know educational experience in itself to, um, to stimulate wonder and compassion, but nobody has integrated that in to you know an actual uh, educational curriculum for um, compassion. Well, you know, I hadn't thought about this before, but now that you're asking that, um, the CARE program has a PowerPoint slides that go with every session. And when we have breaks or in between the didactic part, which is a lot of the time, we put up slides of beautiful landscapes that I downloaded from the internet. And I had never thought about it as being part of the intervention, but all the teachers tell us that they find them very calming and they really enjoy having those pictures up rather than just having nothing, you know, which we could just turn it off. But I had never, it would be interesting to see if there was a difference in the training, whether we had those pictures up or not, but. Has anybody ever tried that? I mean, that really is an interesting question to integrate sort of biophilic perspectives in terms of engendering compassion. Has anybody watched any of that that we know about in, in any of these school kind of programs? Oh. Ah, thank you. Well, just to comment briefly, yeah. I mean, most of, most of the students that, that go through these programs live in inner city areas, and there just really isn't much nature there. Um, so it really involved being involved, sort of taking them out of their local areas. And, and there are programs that do that, of course. And then, like, I'm in Tucson, there's all sorts of very active gardening programs for, for really, you know, kids, inner city kids. But, but they, they sort of flow down separate streams, and they, have, they come from different, the, the, the impetus come from different places in my experience. But it's interesting that that is something that, that within the compassion, social and emotional learning type world, it'd be something interesting to look at we, if there was some practical way to do it. Well, we are doing it in the Compassionate Schools Project. We just haven't gotten there yet. I mean, it's on the board of something we're going to develop, yeah. because these schools in Kentucky have gardens. So our intention is for the spring part of the curriculum to be in the garden. Um, we just haven't actually written that curriculum yeah. yet, <laughs> but it's, it's in the planning stage. Very cool. Who's next? Hi, I have a question I'd like to ask all of you. Recently in the news, we've been aware that there have been iconic figures in the field of sports that have used corporal punishment um, with children, with their spouses, partners. And in terms of children in the classroom, particularly in preschool classrooms, some children are going home to environments where corporal punishment is part of the disciplinary practices. So in terms of the exposure to that kind of trauma or that type of um, cultural norm, how can that impact the child coming into the classroom in terms of practicing mindfulness? Because 
It might be a calm in the classroom that's encouraging them to focus and use self-restraint, self-control, and they go home to a situation where they possibly could be victimized um, repeatedly. I think you're pointing to one of the biggest problems is that if we continue to focus just on classrooms or just on teachers or just on students in the classroom, we're neglecting the context in which these children are raised in. And so one part of the solution is involving parents at a simplistic level, but there are larger social, structural issues involved in that as well. From the simple level of how do we engage parents without making them feel like we are doing the parenting for them or correcting for them, but also some of the social, socially conditioned blocks that different communities have about being involved in this kind of training and so on. This came alive um, in working in the foster system for me in Atlanta with the CBCT team and that we were helping these children learn compassion training and then sending them, literally the second the door would open, sending them almost into a different world in which the way of relating to children was um, not very kind always. Right, and so how, what are we doing to the children? Are, are, and a question of safety, are we doing a disservice by helping them open, be more relaxed, feel more vulnerable, and then sending them into circumstances in which that's actually not very helpful for them? So this is critical, and this is something we need to be addressing as we think about these kinds of programs and context. I just want to just address that for a minute because there's a lot of evidence that a, a safe and secure classroom school environment, when children can bond to a school environment, it actually can be a protective factor against the negative effects of child abuse. So I, I, I don't think we're doing any harm by doing this because we're helping the children feel like at least school is safe. Um, and if they can consistently feel that school is safe, it can build uh, you know, resilience that will help protect them. Um, but I agree that we definitely have to continue working with the, um, the parents when we can. But um, school is a really important place for kids to learn uh, resilience. So I have a question as a follow-up with the Robert because we had a little discussion before um, about the environment. How do you, how do you um, measure the, the beauty of the environment compared to sort of the inner work that you're doing with a, with a student, the impact it has on the well-being of the children and... I mean, how do you measure the, the beauty of the No, external? exactly. No, no the, the environment, the classroom. This is a talk about the classroom yes. yeah. all the time. So the, how, what it looks like, the environment, and what, what impact that has on... on uh, the built space, the work that you're doing. Words, exactly. What yeah, qualities the, of the built space? The measure that we used is called the CLASS. It stands for Classroom Assessment. I, I can't remember what CLASS stands for, but it was developed by Bob Pianta, who's the dean of the Curry School of Education where I am at University of Virginia. And it is an observational measure where a neutral person comes in, observes the classroom, and they fill out a, a, a rating scale and they ask a lot of questions and they look at frequencies of kinds of behaviors and they identify, they link the behaviors with the, the coding structure protocol. And then it has three areas. It has the area of emotional climate, like is this a positive emotional climate or a negative emotional climate? Um, is it, is the organization, is, does it have good classroom organization? And that's, does the teacher manage the classroom well? Do things flow? Do kids, are kids actually involved in the learning process? And then instructional support. How does the teacher set up learning activities for students? So that, that's how it, is uh, that what, what you about, were asking? No, no, it was no. more about the physical environment. The, environment. the, the oh. physical environment. Do no, we don't, we don't measure that. There's, so so you know, whether sort of it's, it's gray concrete or sort of nice and bright. Yeah, and, well, the know. research we've been doing is in the Bronx in New York, and most of the buildings are really awful. Wow. I, mean, I can only say, I mean, I'd say across the board, they're probably pretty universally awful. Okay. So. I, I really feel for you. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So I have, I have a, a second question. We talked about control before, uh, that the children who, who uh, display the best control, they, they perform better later in life. So how is that, is that related genetically or is it, um, sort of more a reflection of their understanding of the consequences that... So the um, understanding that we have, at least from psychology, is that there's an interaction of environment as well as predisposition that may be genetic or whatever the case may be. But what um, the real question is, so is the child fixed at whatever level of self-control they come into this life with, or can it be shaped? Can it be increased? And that's, I think, the crux of the question. If there's ways to promote this, then it... Um, really could shift the entire population. 
So part of that study, the, the Moffat study that uh, <clears throat> Lisa discussed, was that they also observed that any change in self-control over the lifespan resulted in, in a change in the public health outcomes later in life. So it shows that it's something that's plastic. Thank you for your presentations. I want to ask to all of you if you have in your studies maybe include or analyze bullying and if you think that these programs can have an effect and influence in the occurrence of bullying, that is one of the really big problems of the schools nowadays. And also, do you think that maybe these interventions can be directed a bit or shaped a bit into the prevention of bullying? Yeah, so I, I've actually collected data on bullying um, that uh, the empathy results that I showed um, I was hoping or I was interested to see if there was a relationship with bullying, um, <clears throat> but I didn't see any relationships there. And it may be that the measurements we're using, these self-report measures, are just not very um, accurate because there may be a fear of, uh, of responding in a way that's not favorable to them or they may be just trying to respond normatively. All of the problems that, that go with self-report measurements. So. Uh, we're actually looking into other kinds of measures of bullying, maybe not so much based on self-report. Um, <clears throat> it isn't a primary focus of, of our work, but it, it really is very important. I know that through this uh, program, uh, the Yes for Schools program, they really do emphasize the sense of, of belongingness, of um, you know, the students really being very much the same and part of the same community, having the same desires and needs. And that really tends to foster the sense of relatedness that I think would reduce bullying, but we just don't have measurements on it. I was just going to add to that. Um, believe it or not, teachers sometimes inadvertently model bullying behavior. And um, that actually shows up in the negative climate dimension of that classroom. And we are seeing reductions in that. So um, I think that's really a good first step if you can help teachers be more mindful of their own behavior and how it might mo be modeling bullying. In, in, in intention, unintentionally, nobody wants to be a bully. How is everyone? <laughs> I'm here. Uh, I was going to say I was here to bully everyone. Yeah. But, uh, well, what a wonderful day, and uh, I really want to thank our panelists. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, the end of day one, uh, and I think uh, tomorrow eve is is going to be even better. And uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, enjoy San Francisco this evening. If any of you want advice where to go or not to go, I have great experience with both. Uh, so just ask me any questions. And again, uh, thank you all so much for being with us.